It's been years of solid sales for automakers, but will the bulls keep running? From the floor of the New York Auto Show, three of Wall Street's best analysts see the bears starting to gather. Coming up next on AutoLine This Week. Underwriting for AutoLine This Week has been provided by Borg Warner. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. We're coming to you from the floor of the New York Auto Show. And as long as we were in New York, we figured out we ought to take a look at what the financial community thinks of the automotive industry. And to do just that, we've got three terrific analysts joining us today, including Kevin Tynan with Bloomberg Intelligence, Marianne Keller with Marianne Keller & Associates, and John Murphy with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. I want to thank all three of you for coming, for coming here today. So I, I'm just going to throw this out on the floor. What will it take for the automotive industry to do to ever satisfy Wall Street? It seems like Wall Street just does not like any of the multiples or earnings that the industry is delivering, even though in some cases it's all-time record profits. Marianne, what's it going to take? Well, right now, the, the market is responding to what it's seeing. And the market is looking at into the future, and it doesn't like what it's seeing. It's seeing number one, margin compression, lower sales, because we're clearly at the peak and the indications are that things are going to slow down. They have slowed down already in the first quarter. Um, so the outlook for the earnings is probably negative. The outlook for dividends, I mean, certainly there's some speculation as to whether there'll be dividend growth or dividend retrenchment. So I think that that's what the stock market is looking at. Investors are always looking into the future. They don't pay for current earnings. They pay for what they think is coming. And I think that's the, you know, sort of problem. We've got a cyclical industry. It's a mature, slow-growing cyclical industry. It's intensely competitive. The auto companies are also in a phase where they're having to invest in technology for which we can't predict when it's going to mature or materialize and how much they're going to make off of it. And in the meantime, Look at this show. Everybody's got beautiful cars. Who's the loser? You know, who's going to give up market share? And so you've got a battle for share going on where everyone has right now too much inventory, rising incentives, and not no one's making much progress in terms of capturing you know more of the share of the market. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, Marion's points are all very valid. I think what we're looking at right now is there's some red flags being thrown, particularly on the very significant reliance on, on leasing in the industry. The industry is leasing at a 30% rate right now, which means that we're going to see these cars boomerang back to the, the dealers in three years as used vehicle prices are going down and rates are going up, which means these people aren't going to be able to afford to buy the same new car. They might buy a, a cheaper new car or not buy a new car at all, and that's where the real I think risk that investors are seeing right now is coming in. I think capital discipline um, is really a big question right now because there's a lot of capital being redeployed to make some acquisitions, to buy back stock, and a lot of investors are very skeptical as to sort of the resilience and liquidity this industry will have going through the next downturn because we're not that long away or far away from some pretty big bankruptcy. So I think there's a lot of skepticism still out there in the investment community. The industry could get in trouble again in the next downturn. I think okay. it's- let, let me make two points. And, and I agree with John and, and Marion as well. I think there's an opportunity for the dealer groups, uh, somebody like CarMax, which is used car only, and that for the first time in, in this cycle, there's going to be good late model, low mileage vehicles coming back off lease. So I think from the consumer's perspective, we may see that shift down to good quality pre-owned, off-lease certified pre-owned vehicles, uh, which will definitely put pressure on the OEMs on the new car side prices will have to react. Um, you know, and the other point to what Marianne was talking about, the one thing that's a little bit confounding is that it's almost like the automakers weren't rewarded on the way up, on the recovery, mm -hmm. right? After all right. the costs were rationalized after 2008, 2009, where was the reward? And now you say, well, we're looking forward. It was like, well, were we not looking forward in, in 2010 when all the operating profit came back and, and GM and Ford do 10 billion in operating and income last year? Never got rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, one of the things that you have to remember, and, and you raised it with the leasing, is that auto cycle peaks are driven by, finance, uh, by financing, affordable financing. And what we're seeing, not just the return of all of these four million lease cars, which are depressing the used car values, but on the financing now, we're beginning to see a pullback. Defaults are up. The generosity of lenders is changing. 
uh, what fueled this this recovery. And again, you know, it's it, it's all these little things that are underneath, and people are skeptical of the longevity of these things. While they're happening, yes, they fuel revenue growth, they fuel sales growth, they fuel income growth. On the other hand, they they're not sustainable. When you have lenders offering 84-month car loans, and today I believe the average is around 83, how far can you go? We've allowed people to accumulate an enormous amount of automotive debt, either conventional debt or lease debt, but it's, are, are, can these price increases be supported? They were supported by the extension of debt and 0% loans. We know that rates are going up. We know that you can't really go out beyond 84 months because, as one dealer said to me over the last week, loans amortize at a constant rate, vehicles depreciate at an accelerated rate, and what we're building up is negative equity. So somebody who's got a three or four or five year old car can't come back into the market. They still owe so much on that car that paying off that debt for many people would be prohibitive. Yeah, I think in the in the belly of the beast also is I mean people look at auto credit as a, as a big risk risk uh, parameter for for the auto industry. The, at the new vehicle side, it's a little bit of, a little bit of a risk, but it's down to the 11 plus year old cars. There's been a lot of subprime financing and a lot of untraditional vehicles created for investors to chase this very high yield on floor plan financing for buy here pay here dealers, but also for the you know the consumer that's starting to tighten just a little bit. Doesn't seem like we're gonna have a crisis necessarily in, in, in auto lending, but from the bottom down, from the you know from bottom up, you'll get this sort of tightening, and the top down you have this, this tsunami of cars coming off of lease. So you get pressure from supply on the top down and a tightening credit from the bottom up, and you got this sandwich where used vehicle pricing is gonna come under significant pressure. Well, Residual values go down, it's hard to lease cars, it's high, hard to trade in cars with the negative equity that Marianne was talking about. So you are seeing this, you know, just these slight things that are tweaking in the wrong direction for the industry right now. And I think I think that the leasing is the key in there, right? If residuals drop where you can't get leasing done, because I think, you know, this 30% being sort of the new normal is where the consumer wants to be. 36 months, whatever the, the average term is around 36, 33 months, and you're out, right? You pay your payments for 36 months, you hand the keys back, I was in warranty the whole time, I have this constant payment, and I don't have to worry about negative equity, I just have to turn the keys and I have to go lease something else. And I think that's why we'll consistently see 25 to 30% lease penetration, because it's sort of like your smartphone, right? Whether you need a new one or not, you do for your upgrade, you get another one. There's new technology coming in, and it allows the consumer to keep up with the latest technology in vehicles. 33 months, take the keys, give me the next greatest thing. It's convenient for the consumer. On the other hand, what it does, I mean, we, we have to under, admit that these, loan, these uh, leases were subvented just as much as the loans were. So the, what we're seeing now in the captives is the enormous financial exposure they have as residuals decline versus what they predicted. So they're going to face losses. And what we have, what they've tried to do now on leases is call, pull back a little bit. They've tried to raise the rates. They're not leasing certain types of vehicles where, which depreciate faster. So I don't know that leasing is going to stay at 30%. I don't know that they want it to stay at 30%. <laughs> well, I, I think also, though, that to me, is there really a difference if you're going to put $2,500, $5,000 on the hood or you're going to bump up that residual value on the back end? When you look at brand loyalty coming out of a lease, it's much higher than it is on a purchaser of finance. So it's almost as if the automaker or the finance company is saying, well, I'm going to have to pay you to take this vehicle home anyway. I'd rather give it to the finance company and try and make them whole at wholesale three years down the road. But I know you're going to come back to my dealership with an immediate need for another vehicle. Let's wait and see how happy investors are when they see the results from the well, captain. It's, and essentially, it's this massive backdoor incentive and right. price cutting that's going on, which is going to need to get piled on and piled on, and that's what's starting, that's starting that's to really right. happen. And that's here, what's which is really, da investors. really dangerous. The, the thing that dealers have mentioned to me in the last couple of weeks is their fear that while used car values are declining just because of the supply demand imbalance, they're terrified that the auto companies are going to go into an incentive derby. If they do that, then it forces residual values on, or, uh, on you late model used cars to decline. I think the ratio is something like a uh, hundred dollar incentive equals a seventy dollar price cut on a late model car. There's some kind of uh, relationship like that. So they're afraid of the value of their inventory. 
A lot of dealers are cutting back on inventory. They don't want to keep as many cars. They're aiming for 45-day turns. So, you know, they're adjusting to the market, market because they're seeing it every day. They're also trying to order fewer new cars because they're sitting longer. John, we're seeing so much action vis-a-vis uh, -vis General Motors. It seems to be certain elements of Wall Street really picking on GM. Why, why GM? I mean, other automakers don't deliver all that great of a value either, or a valuation, so why, why everyone picking on GM? Listen, as we were talking about before, there's such extreme skepticism as to the discipline of, of management in getting through the next downturn. Now, I think the GM management team has proven they're fairly disciplined and are running the company incredibly well. You look at product, you look at technology, you look at what they've done with the balance sheet, what they've done with labor. Um, they've really, really fixed the company. Um, but the reality is investors are waiting for the next downturn to understand how this model, this new model, that they're looking at is really going to perform and how the management team will perform. So there's a lot of frustrated investors. You may argue, we're neutral on GM stock right now, you may argue it's a great value if you look five to 10 years out, if this discipline comes in, but there's a lot of people that are frustrated right now. And the real significant risk here is that these folks that are looking for short-term performance in the stock motivate the management or push the management to make short-term decisions that end up harming them in the long run. And that's really a significant risk right now. Management team's doing a great job. They need to stay the course, run their game plan, and on the other side, they'll be rewarded. I think to answer your question as to why GM, because there's nobody else to go after. You can't go after a Japanese company. French Peugeot is half owned by the French government. Renault is owned by the French government. So you're government. saying that Japan will protect the Japanese company? Absolutely. Companies. There's no, there's, there's Same no with such the European thing companies. as an activist in, in Japan. Name me one situation <laughs> where an American activist has gone in and Tried. done anything. Tried. They try. Yeah. yeah. But there's no way they're going to be able to influence Toyota and say, you know, got a big cash hoard, divvy it up, buy back stock. They don't even understand that concept. As far as they're concerned, their motivation is invest. That's it. <laughs> And so Ford is protected by the family, presumably. Sure. Yeah. And sure. what about FCA? Nobody's interested in that one? Well, I think that that one would love to be acquired. Yeah. <laughs> They'd love uh, to see some activists sure. in there. And they have promoted themselves with the activists to try to facilitate some sort of combination. And why you, and why you could, has it not happened? Well, and you could argue with Fiat Chrysler. Yeah, with Fiat Chrysler, there's not any excess cash or cash flow. Right. So there's there's a tremendous amount of investment needs to go on at Fiat Chrysler to turn the ship there. So it's not like you're sitting on any excess cash at Fiat Chrysler at this point. Quite yeah. the opposite. Yeah. And so who is the logical uh, partner? General Motors just exited Europe. They don't need anything else in Europe. Certainly not the Fiat properties. Right. And bankruptcy allowed them to streamline the brands. Why would they need more brands? Mm -hmm. right. And if anything, you look at the FCA portfolio, and you know it's really Jeep Ram. You know, so it has to be that sort of bolt-on fit for somebody who needs that presence. And and none of the really large automakers need that. General Motors with GMC and what they do in Chevrolet and the other brands just doesn't need another truck-heavy portfolio. Why wouldn't one of the Chinese companies step in and get an FCA? You know, I, I think right now you're looking at a company that's got a, a lot to prove and a, a lot to fix. You have massive investment in powertrain that still needs to go on. You've got a product cycle which looks good, but they've slipped on timing of, of introductions. And you also have a balance sheet that's four and a half billion, you know, net euro debt. So to get into that, you're going to have to write a check of, you know, 15 billion or so to buy the company. And then you're going to have to plow a whole lot more capital in to, to, you know, to fix or to, you know, invest in the, in the product cycle, which they're doing to some degree, but it keeps, it keeps slipping. So I think there's a big, uh, big, big check that needs to be written there that will keep a lot of people away. Very interesting. Kevin, what do you think uh, Wall Street's perception is on all this investment that's going into future technology, especially autonomous vehicles and this whole move to mobility services? Yeah, I think uh, to their credit, somebody like General Motors has, there's a, the management's done a good job with the new philosophy, whereas I think prior to the bankruptcy, a lot of the autonomous or alternative drivetrain vehicles would have sort of been dismissed as not profitable business endeavors and, and just forgotten about. Uh, where you look at products like the Chevrolet Bolt, I think what they're doing is getting in position to be in position to where if that technology becomes mainstream, they can scale up with it. If it doesn't, the investment wasn't crippling, uh, but I think the difference now, what Mary has done there to what, what that company was before, unprofitable business use, it would have just been more trucks, more trucks, more trucks. That's where the money is. Uh, but I think she has the vision to see that, hey, we need to be there if this is what happens. And you look with the investment in Lyft. So worst case is we send Chevrolet Bolt to California for Lyft drivers. We, you know, we satisfy our, our 
regulatory requirements there and we can sell what we want. If the consumer does jump on board with that kind of technology, they scale up and they sell more to the consumer. What do you think, Marianne? All this investment in battery electric cars that don't make a penny, there, there, there's no return on this. I, and I'm, I, I understand why the auto industry has to do it. The regulations are forcing them to. My question is, what does the investment community think about this? I think the investment community is uncertain, and I think that's an, another ingredient in what, you know, what, what these, why these stocks are priced and behave the way they do. There's a lot of money being diverted into autonomous cars and various investments and software, et cetera, et cetera. They're staffing up in this whole area. Um, I think that there's a defensive reason why they've done that. They don't want Apple and Google and other Silicon Valley companies to capture whatever incremental fee-based revenue there is off of a car. Uh, they're not going to let what happened with, uh, you know, sort of mapping <laughs> happen again. So I think that that's all good. I think but that's technology that's in the future and no one knows whether it's going to generate the same margins as a car, bigger margins or smaller margins. And we know that technology, you know, needs to be refreshed probably every six months. By the time it's in a car, it's obsolete given the cycle of building a car and the shorter cycle for developing technology. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of unknowns here. We know that need to, to invest. Some of the stuff is very exciting. It's going to, it's undoubtedly some portion of it will generate huge profits for them, but there will also be investments that they're making that will, that will just fail. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, when you look at this, there's kind of two things in the car that are going on right now. It's getting from A to B, and then there's utilizing, you know, the time that people are in their car to, to create, create incremental streams of revenue. And there's little risk that the automaker is going to be wildly disintermediated in getting people from A to B. They need to do that more efficiently with better powertrains, potentially different kinds of powertrains, and hopefully more expediently through more efficient traffic patterns and maybe higher speed lanes over time. The question is, do they have the gusto and the investment and, and the know-how to really compete with the Apples and the Googles in the world of connecting with the consumer, collecting this data and utilizing it in a way that really creates value for them in their core business and then also in the time that people are spending in cars. So there's a lot of debate here and where this will land with investors. And to Marian's point, the uncertainty is something that a lot of people in the investment community don't like. And the payoffs are years out. And we're used to seeing product cycles and getting paid you know, further down the line, but there's always something that's new that's creating cash flow to support the future, the future investment. This is just future investment that's coming right, you know, right now for what will be payoffs in the future. And that's something that's tough for investors to really grasp. grasp. How come Tesla gets a walk on all this? I mean, here's a company that hasn't made any money for a given year. They've had a couple of profitable quarters, uh, bleeding red ink. And yet, there's, as you said earlier, Marianne, Wall Street prices to future earnings. But uh, why do they, how can they have the kind of valuation that they do? I don't know. <laughs> I certainly don't understand it, having spent my life following, you know, slow-growing, capital-intensive businesses, uh, which they are. I mean, eventually they have to, they're, they're an auto producer, they're going to have to have the same kind of balance sheet as an auto, as an auto manufacturer. I mean, they're not going to own the world. So... Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think when you look at it, they've done some great stuff with their, with their vehicles. Over-the-air updates, the fact that it's essentially a, a phone platform instead of a car platform that changes over time. There's some really interesting things that they've done that I think, think have exhibited to the industry and investors where the industry might be in five to ten years. But their ability to execute on, on pure production has been subpar at best relative to you know, the core companies and you still need the actual physical car and do it you know, profitably and gener to generate cash flow to support the business going forward. So there's a huge hope trade that's going on here that is years out and the more that they grow their volume, the more they become an auto manufacturer and the more the valuation makes less and less sense. So it's a very curious thing that's going on right now, but they have one very unique competitive advantage, right? And that's essentially no cost capital. Right, they can raise capital and they, when they when they need to. There's not a lot of questions asked, and you have you know 10 cent that just you know piled in. So if you look at this recent run in the stock from the 240, 250 range to above 300, everybody is now a little bit more comfortable that as much as cash they as they burn, they can always keep going and get it. And that's a that's a risky trade to make because cost of capital can go up and availability can come down, and then the story ends. And and their metrics on how they're valued aren't the same. Sure. So, so you have no cost capital with a completely different set of metrics that say, oh, it's worth more. Well, whether you're a solar company or you're a battery company or you're an automaker, we look at it and say, well, there's financial physics that 
an automaker must adhere to uh, that they don't have to. And, and I've said, you know, their competitive advantage is, is that they lose money and burn cash where all the other automakers basically say, why would we do that? So it looks like Tesla can do things that other automakers can't. And all that is, is purposely lose money where it's not that the product is better or the technology is better. It's just that the other automakers, you know, I, and you can't convince me that BMW can't write a check and do exactly the same thing, if not better, with the financial strength, the, the design, the history of the company. It's just that they look at that segment and go, why would I do that? It's, it's a money loser. You guys are all sort of painting a very negative picture for the automotive <laughs> industry. Is there any hope? I mean, with this move to mobility services, potentially with a, a, a new market emerging for the OEMs at higher margins than they can do building cars, or this ability to monetize data that cars are going to generate or generate already today, and once you get to autonomy, potentially generate far more data. Is, is there hope on the horizon somewhere out there? Well, I think you just mentioned a lot of the exciting things that are going on in the industry. So we talk about the cycle, we're all steep, very you know, deeply in the cycle and understanding how it works, and it's going to be a tough time as we go through the next couple of years and maybe even in the next five, you know, five years for, for the industry as volumes ultimately come down. But on the other side, there will be a lot of cash generated, there'll be investment in this future technology that keeps going on, and there'll be more value creation on the other side. The risk is that the companies and the industry have done a great job of, of producing better and better product for the consumer. So the value capture has been to the consumer, not to the investors and the companies. And in this next go round, they have to retain the data and figure out how to monetize it, figure out how to hold on the re to the revenue and the profit that they generate on the other cycle and return that to investors and not just to consumers. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts, Marianne? I, I agree. I think um, you know this is an industry that uh, you know, it's, it, it is a slow growing, mature cyclical industry. That, hasn't changed, it will not change. Uh, we've been in an up cycle, we, we ha we've talked about some of the ingredients that are going to cause us to perhaps decline uh, over the next couple of years, not fall off a cliff like we did in 2008, but, but nevertheless, we know we're at the peak of the cycle, we're probably at the peak of the earnings cycle. So all of these things play into how people perceive these stocks and the valuations that they, that they get. Uh, and you know, and it's a it's a risky business. It's a capital intensive business, and it is brutally competitive. I mean, can and I think I, I like some of the moves that GM and Ford have have made over the last uh, year. I love the fact that they sold Opel. Get out of Europe if you can't make money there. Get out of it. If you're if you're changing the nature of the company and you're going more into if I'll, I'll generally say services uh, or technology based services. You cannot afford to have to drag along businesses just to say you're a global auto company. So I do like the sort of changing mentality that I see, but they still are a global auto company that is large, capital intensive, and unfortunately cyclical. Yeah, and I and I think that what you're what you're seeing now is that this is not the normal cycle. Things coming out of 2008, 2009 are very different. There's a lot of investment made when operating income or earnings started to come back and that technology cycle compressed very short. So if you look at the average vehicle age, call it 11 years, what an 11 year old vehicle looks like technology wise to where we are today is, is probably the widest gap at any point in history. So it's not a normal cycle. Um, and I think what the automakers are doing are recognizing that saying, okay, we know it's going to be very different. It's very different already. And now let's work backwards to say, how do we get to that point in the future? Uh, it's certainly not going to be easy, but I think we have to let go of the concept of 11 years ago and say, whatever this industry is going to be is going to be very different, whether it's we don't get to drive anymore, we don't get to shift ourselves anymore, any of those concepts, but that's just the way that it's going to be going forward and they have to monetize it. Marianne, as you say, it's always been a cyclical industry. It's always been capital intensive. So why are these activist inventor, uh, investors trying to change the, the rules of the game? Shouldn't they just take their money and go elsewhere for their growth? <laughs> Probably they should. I mean, I don't know why they think that they can pressure the auto companies into things like stock buybacks or two classes of stocks. I, I just don't understand what that gets. Uh, this is a business that is globally very competitive. It is capital intensive. It is cyclical. You want to play in it. You have to. You have to understand that that what American investors 
activist investors want is not necessarily what the Japanese experience or the European experience, and it's a global industry and you have to compete globally, not based upon, you know, how do I manipulate or create some sort of financial engineering that's going to make me a little bit more money, but probably make the auto company a little weaker. John, quick thought, we're yeah, down to the end. You know, real quick, I mean, I think you can always argue that returns can be depressed by a company holding too much cash, but a company holding too much cash can't go bankrupt and, and, and can't get itself in financial duress. So at this point in the cycle, without certainty as to where the cycle's gonna go, and with the, the history of not that long ago, these companies having some spectacular bankruptcies, holding too much cash right now should not be penalized. And I think there's a, a real school of thought out there that their dividends could potentially be at risk in the next downturn. So holding, on ca holding cash to support those dividends and keep your dividend investors might be a great strategy in the near term. Real good, quick, quick thought. Yeah, and I, and I think we're gonna get this little stress test right here and, and we'll see. Uh, you know, the rationalization that happened after 2008, 2009, uh, you know, how, how these companies can still earn at the bottom of the cycle. Real good, we're gonna have to wrap it up. Fascinating discussion. I wanna thank all three of you for being here. Kevin Tynan, Marianne Keller, John Murphy, thanks for taking the time to come and be on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you all of you enjoyed this as much as I did. Underwriting for Autoline this week has been provided by Borg Warner.